I'd like to talk to you today about what we're doing at, at Boeing with Lean in the Executive Office, specifically using Lean for Leaders within our organization. I want to address three issues. First, how I got started in Lean. Second, our early experiences in engineering at Boeing with Lean. And then finally, what we're doing with Lean for Leaders. So I started from a NASA background. Uh, at NASA, I was a research engineer, spent the first half of my career there, worked in large space systems, had the uh, privilege of working on the Hubble with some problem resolutions there, and working with the uh, shuttle, specifically with the shuttle in the landing gear. What I learned at NASA was the necessary discipline and the scientific approach to any problem. Now, many of my problems there were very long range. I was looking at basic research that isn't on an airplane today 20 years later. I was looking at research that was 35 years out into the future, something that might come about and for many of those topics I worked on, hasn't come about. It was important work, but I found my greatest satisfaction was when I had a near-term problem. On the Hubble, <clears throat> you may recall when the Hubble had uh, needed new glasses. The Hubble was launched, and we had a problem with the lens. It had been cut wrong, and we went up and put a new lens on the Hubble. So we improved the sharpness of the picture. At that same time, the solar arrays were replaced. And indeed, we replaced them so we had more power. But what didn't make the press is that there was a vibration problem caused by the solar arrays on the early construction when they went from shadow from darkness into light. There was a step gradient in temperature, and they would snap, and they would vibrate for about 20 minutes. We had every 45 minutes, we went through that temperature gradient. So half of our time was lost with a simple vibration in the solar arrays. The challenge for me was I was on the team that discovered where that vibration was coming from. And I found that my passion was around solving real-time problems that were going to go onto a real structure, and I was going to see results now. The same on the work with the shuttle. I found my excitement wasn't the long-term planning, but enabling it to land at the Kennedy and save $2 million per flight because we didn't land out in the desert in California and have to ferry it back. My part on that team was a small part, but great satisfaction in solving a real problem. So I learned not only the necessity of careful, uh, a careful, disciplined approach to any problem solving, but I also learned what excited me most. So I went to Boeing and had lots of opportunities to solve problems for today's airplanes. Anytime you're in a big company with something as complex as an airplane, you're going to have lots of opportunities to solve problems. But for me, it was exciting. I had come from NASA with a background both in acoustics and structures. I started as an acoustic engineer. And I don't know about your large companies, but at Boeing, there are many opportunities. I stayed in acoustics for about 14 months. Uh, na uh, my NASA experience, I had led national teams. Uh, between academia, industry, and NASA. Boeing recognized that experience, and about 15 months into my career at Boeing, I was leading of a design team of 400 people for designing the fuselage of a new derivative airplane, the 737-900. I had lots of problems to solve, and I was having fun. I was also using those technical strengths that I had developed at NASA. I moved into project management in the structural, uh, structural dynamics, 
process engineering, became a first line manager and saw the people side of problems, a different set of problems of how to get that motivation for people to use their deep skills. Um, and it was after that varied experience that I was asked to be the lean leader for 737 Engineering Group. This happened after 9-11. In 2001, we had our crisis that drove us to lean implementation. When um, airplanes were used in terrorist attacks and the industry was devastated, Boeing was going to lay off many of their engineers. And the vice president of engineering for the 3-7 program asked me to take what I had done as a first line manager in improving the productivity of that one group and apply that to all of engineering. Now, I had some basic lean principles at that time, which I had applied in a local environment. And I basically took that same approach with engineering. We decided that um, lean in 2001 was viewed by most engineers in Boeing as not applying to me. It applied to the factory, but certainly not to me in the office in engineering. The background I had in a variety of engineering experiences allowed me to come into an engineering group and they would say, but you don't understand my work. And I was able to say, yes, yes, I do. I've done work like yours. And yes, this applies. We started with an unusual model. We said we'll find early adopters, people that were open to the idea of lean, that were willing to try something new, and we would let small projects begin throughout the organization, and that we would use the success of those projects to create the enthusiasm, the chain reaction. We used management to set the direction and strategy, but we used a grassroots, bottom-up approach to find the enthusiasm, celebrate the successes, and help convince a reluctant audience that indeed, maybe I ought to try also. It was very interesting at that point how the executives approved the metrics. There was one camp that wanted to measure how many workshops did we have? How many projects did we have? Check the box, a checklist. <laughs> and we had a vice president that said, no, we won't measure that. We won't measure the number of people we train. We won't measure the number of projects we start. We will look at the bottom line of how we run our business. And if what we're doing is truly affecting things, that's where we'll see it. It was that foresight that allowed us to really tout the success of lean in engineering in commercial airplanes because it affected our bottom line. So what kind of results did we get with this very simple grassroots uh, type approach? First, the flow for our customer intros within engineering, our portion, we were able to shrink by 33%. That was significant. When we took this to individual processes, an individual process here, another here, on our individual processes, we had much greater results. We had touch time decreases by 54% on average across the board. We had um, first pass quality increase by nearly 60%. <clears throat> Our maximum with one group, when they really studied what am I doing and what do I need to do, they reduced 83% of what they were doing. Because we had found over the years we had adopted doing many things that were not essential. But we did them because we had always done them, or we had grown into doing them. So we took a very rigorous approach 
within the individual processes. So what did I learn in this? What did we as an engineering community learn through this approach? One, we learned that we needed standard work in order to get the gains, and especially in order to hold the gains. We also found that we needed constant attention to hold those gains, or we had that tendency to level off. And the reason was we didn't have a full integrated system and culture that supported that continuous improvement all the time. Well, we'll fast forward a few years to 2007. Actually, late in 2006, I was asked to join the product development organization within commercial airplanes and to find a way to bring lean not into our sustaining engineering for our ongoing products, but into product development. I went back to reading books, searching out articles, attending conferences, and trying to solve this problem of how would we do product development in a very systematic, broad way across this organization in developing a new airplane. And it was at that time that I came across in a seminar, much like you have perhaps for the first time today, this very intriguing model developed by QV System, looking at Toyota and how they have a full system in approaching lean. We knew what we wanted. We wanted a team approach, and we thought we found this in this methodology. We wanted a way to do concurrent work because we had many different parts creating one airplane. We wanted quick problem solving. We wanted to align an entire organization. And we brought in participants from the factory, from customer service, from service engineering, from the full spectrum, instead of keeping our group small and narrow. So we knew we needed a way to align everyone. We wanted to be able to direct and run the group quickly and easily, and we wanted especially to increase our, our value-added time. We knew that our meetings consumed way too high a percentage of our time, and we wanted them to be short and efficient so that we could have more value-added creative time by our engineers. So we saw the system. And we figured, we're really smart people. This is sticky notes on the wall. For heaven's sakes, we can do this on our own. So we did. This was a picture of our first Obey board. It didn't work so well. <laughs> it was probably larger than this screen behind me. If you were at the top of the board, you had to be tall. And if you were at the bottom of the board, you were squatting down to look at your sticky notes. <clears throat> we had the sense, I'm glad, to say, it isn't the system that's wrong that we saw in the conference. Perhaps we missed something. So what we missed? We missed the behavioral part. Basically, what we took here was take it, was what we did here was take all of our detailed plans that were in the computer, transfer them to sticky notes, put them on the wall, and think we would get added efficiency. Doesn't work that way. We had to go back and learn that it was what happens in front of the wall, and it was that focus on the critical items. That was what we missed. So we started again, and this time, we brought in a consultant. <laughs> and you might be able to guess who it was. It was Takashi. We brought in a consultant who had been on the journey before, someone that could guide us, and someone that could train us to, to become self-sufficient in the methodology in a new way of thinking and approaching. We had a formal kickoff and restructured our board. Let me back up for a minute. I want you to take a look at this board and this board. We had a bit more focus when we restarted. So we had a very 
simple, clear system, and what went on the board had to support the targets that were listed at the, at the far left side. <clears throat> we found with a few targets we could focus the team. We did take it from the VP level down to the working engineer level in a tiered approach, and we did that immediately um, so that we could engage the entire team. What we learned, we learned experientially about the three levels of visualization. There are three levels, the first being display. You put it on the wall and it stays there for years. It never changes. The second kind of visualization is for control. That's where we had begun. And the third is a living, changing, dynamic visualization that is all about collaboration and problem solving in front of the board. And that was the gain that we made. We also experientially learned the value of learning by doing. It wasn't enough to have a textbook focus. We had to experience it, try it, and do it. So the most important lessons out of the restart was the power that came by focusing on those few targets, um, the importance of maintaining a disciplined approach in everything that we did, a disciplined report out, a disciplined approach to what went on the board, a disciplined way in how we handled issues. We learned the importance of those issues were to take a look at what the target was and where we were and the gap identified the issues we had to solve. It zeroed us in on where to go look for the issues. So the use of the issue board was a very important part. And then finally, that PDCA thinking be went from being a phrase that we could use and toss about to something that we lived and applied to every meeting to every meeting in front of the board, and to every meeting around a table in a technical discussion. The common question became, at the end of a meeting, what have we accomplished, and what are our next steps? Which was, in a very simple way, an application of that PDCA. We learned the importance of a journey, and we learned that experiential learning takes time. It was not a quick solution. Here's where we were uh, nine months later. I'm going to come back and talk about our OBEA in a few moments. I want to drop first to our six-month mark. At six months, from a leadership team perspective, we saw great improvement. But we wanted to know from the working level engineer up throughout the whole organization, how did people view what was happening and what modifications did we need to make? So any time you run a poll, you run a risk of influencing the results by how you ask the question. So we asked the question with blank sheets of paper because we didn't want to influence the results. We gave small teams blank sheets of paper and said, here's a topic, an area, what's different? Good or bad? What should change with regard to planning? What's different? What should change with regard to our meetings? What's different? What should change? Just very open-ended blank sheets of paper. And we had a very consistent level of feedback. First across the board, the things that made it onto this chart, we had uh, between 65 and 80 percent of the people. It didn't make this chart if 65 percent of the people didn't say, on a blank sheet of paper, didn't name this as an improvement. So across the board, the team saw better visibility. That was in the high 80s. They saw that in the form of better communication, a visibility of the plan, and a visibility of the workload. Understanding when someone 
pushed back some on helping you with a project, understanding their workload and seeing when they could engage more accurately. The, the team also saw an engagement of the leadership with the whole team. The team knew what the leader wanted. The vice president was clear on what the focus was, and everyone could drive in that direction. There was no more guessing. Also, the prioritization across the team was easier to do because the direction was so clear. <clears throat> Greater accountability was probably the aspect of this survey that pleased me most. The team found that their activity was more focused and more proactive. They were anticipating problems and resolving them so it didn't become an issue to the whole team. They also noted the emphasis in OBEA on metrics, which improved our alignment to our yearly goals and again led to individual accountability down to the working level across the team. Better integration and quicker problem solving were the other two big hitters. So we were pleased. These pictures were taken at the uh, nine month mark I want to start your attention over with the blue, what I've highlighted here in blue. We ended up with four targets for this airplane program. And those four targets were then broken down so every contributing organization had a role to play in those targets. To the left of the targets are what we call the barashi, the visualization of quality. One of the organizations, <coughs> excuse me, the propulsion, propulsion group had pushed back the strongest when it came to the idea of creating a one-page picture of what you're going to do with your new engine, what your critical problems are, what, how you've decomposed your targets, and what alternate scenarios you have. And the executive in charge of propulsion laughed and said, you've got to be kidding. You can't do that in, not for an engine. You cannot depict an engine in one sheet of paper. I need a book. Give me 30 pieces of paper and I can get it down to that small of a, of a detail. But within nine months, he had a very strong Barashi that was able to say, here's the direction. We're going in propulsion. Here's alternates that we're exploring. Here's the uh, key targets that we're measuring, how we've decomposed them just for the engine and the metrics I'm using. So that maturity over a nine-month process was very satisfying. Um, <clears throat> as you look across our OBEA, we started, of course, with the visualization of our targets. Every target had a metric, and every organization had a one page. The power here of the one page was if we use that same propulsion executive if, if Dan were to come and visit and go through our OBEA room, that one executive out of propulsion could not only explain to the guest what his direction and quality and planning was, but using the one page, he was now so familiar with other groups that he could explain what the structures group was doing, what wings were doing, what the systems were doing, how the interior was going to change, what the cockpit was going to be like, all from these one-page um, visualizations of quality. Um, from there, every organization had a row across the long-term schedule, and every row was required to name both the leader and their sub-leader. So accountability was evidence even on our long-term schedule. Our near-term look-ahead was a two-week, this week, next week view, and then the issue board with its powerful application of taking um, the current state that didn't meet the target, which came up with an issue that the team could collaborately resolve, was recorded with a next steps with a little yellow sticky note in a very simple visual way. So we found this to be very powerful. And then Boeing decided that this airplane program would not continue. That's what Boeing does. They look at many airplane programs, and this was one that didn't continue. But our history of OBEA did not stop there. At that point, 
I, I need to let you know, Takashi talked to you about TMS, the Toyota Management System, with the Venn diagram showing the four interrelated areas. Within Boeing, we rebranded it Lean for Leaders. So in the rest, of the, uh, the rest of the presentation, you will see LFL as our internal Lean for Leaders. It's what we call the system within Boeing. So our four-year LFL history started with product development, as I just described to you. We then expanded it into the sustaining engineering in the 737 engineering program. You'll remember my early history was with 737 engineering. And we went back to 737 engineering with a new method that was much more comprehensive than what we had started at first. From there, we expanded into our core engineering called in Boeing uh, functional excellence and product integrity. Uh, some groups call it core engineering or um, common engineering. Um, we expanded into that group. Recently, we went into the 737 program, so above engineering, where we um, now have the quality and the production and the manufa uh, manufacturing um, field and delivery system, so the full gamut of the program. And most recently, um, we have begun um, with another team in the certification and government regulation portion. So that's just beginning. We'll actually have our kickoff next week. So it has been expanding through the organization as executives learn of the success of their peer group in applying these principles. We have used OBEA as a consistent starting point. That's been very important because it not only brings in that structured, disciplined approach and quick problem solving and the early gains that that brings, but it also helps the consultant, both external and internal consultants now, understand the organization and understand where the organization is struggling with process uh, bottlenecks so that we can bring in other tools to help them solve their particular problems. Um, <clears throat> the tools themselves then help with those bottlenecks. It has been on a rare occasion that we brought a tool to an organization that isn't taking a comprehensive approach. It's also been a singular occasion where we tried bringing OBEA into an organization where the executive was not ready to begin. We did that once. And now, if an executive says, oh, I've heard so many good things about this, I'd like you to work with this group over here. The VP says, work with that executive to pilot it in my organization. And then, if I like it, I'll adopt it broader. And we say respectfully and courteously, courteously, no. I'll come back and work with you when you're ready to start with yourself and your leadership team. And then that executive may be the first within your organization to go deeper, but we will start with the, with the VP and his or her leadership team. We found it much more effective. We found that you simply cannot delegate the leadership of an organization or the leadership of lean to one of your direct reports. It isn't nearly as effective. If you start with yourself, then you truly are leading your organization and preparing your leadership team to then bring it deeper, that one in six model. <clears throat> so we've been rigorous with that. Um, the developing internal competency. This has been very important. One of the other things we require of the organizational leader is not only must he be willing to start with himself and his leadership team, but he must assign an individual to learn more deeply so that he's building his competency within and not depending on an outside organization to continue his consulting, but developing an internal consultant. 
We have one organization that has, is right on the brink of being declared self-sustaining, and with that, we've introduced the Lean for Leaders studio that Takashi made reference to earlier. It's the next step that helps those internal consultants, those lean practitioners and Kaizen leaders to keep their skills sharp and to bring leaders in to develop their skills more deeply. So you saw this chart previously where we start with the project and the human side together and the phases of, um, of implementation. The visualization is where we really have that early emphasis on OBEA, targets, target decomposition, metrics, and a visual board, a way of visualizing the work that we're doing with even a project. In the higher perspective, we get into the tools, improving our processes, resolving bottlenecks. What we're really shooting for is this new working culture where PDCA is a part of everything we do, and it's a natural way, a natural working habit. Uh, that's probably the biggest hurdle to get through in order to reach the self-sustaining. We currently have, as I mentioned, one new group that kicks off next week, and we have groups in all of these areas. To date, we've worked with seven vice presidents. Five are ongoing with the effort. Um, <clears throat> Some of the comments from the executive. Over the last uh, several months, I've been talking with them and listening very closely to what they're saying so that I could do some sharing here today. And I've heard comments like, in my 35-year history, I've never seen such alignment across my program. Um, one that I think is almost hum humorous, I no longer hate my own meetings. Uh, <laughs> one when we had an outside observer, a VP who came to one of the leadership team meetings to see what was this Obeya business all about. And afterwards, the VP running the meeting said, tell me, what did you see? And the visitor said, something I've never seen in Boeing. Here you are, a vice president in front of a group of people, and they are not reporting out to you. You could walk out of the room, and I don't think the meeting would change. They are working collaboratively to, to solve their problems among themselves. And he looked at the VP and said, frankly, you're just sort of here. And the VP thought this was a wonderful compliment. It was no longer reporting to the VP, but working collaboratively. And we knew with that group, we, had, we were in this new working culture phase. The power of the issue board has been touted as being um, a huge benefit by the executives. From their perspective, not only do they understand the issues better that their teams are facing, but their teams have a clear avenue for getting the help they need from the executive and from one another. And the final one that I, um, that I want to share from the executive point of view was the executive that said, when I look back over the past year, I'm surprised how much my role has changed. Again, a good indication that we were in the new working culture. So what I want to do next is take you through a single organization, an example of how they have implemented over about a year's history. So we're going to do this in three slides. The first slide is to give you a picture of who the organization is. They are a functional group serving multiple programs and a part of the core engineering organization. So when they're asked to give three to five targets, the organizational leader knows what he wants his organization to do. He has a five-year vision of where he wants his organization to be. But all of the VPs in the various program also have their 
three to five targets specific to their program. And you might not be surprised to know that his organizational leader, the core engineering leader, also has targets. So here, this executive has this multiplicity of targets from different sources, and we say reduce it to three to five. And the first reaction is impossible. But then as the, organ as the executive does deep thinking on what can I do to make it clear for my people, he finds that when he's going for his vision, some of his targets certainly encompass these others. So he has to make his, or his targets almost in an umbrella for fashion. Takashi referenced that setting targets is not easy. And before we kick off working those targets across the multiplicity of input, is a very important uh, piece of work so that the targets clearly are few. And what I do with my organization on improving my skills will benefit the quality I'm being asked for from the programs and some of the targets from my organization. So that is the first and difficult step. So with this organization, they did start with establishing their targets, and once they had the targets, they were able to kick off their OBEA. They did that in mid-2009, had better target decomposition about three months later, taking the targets from the organizational level and now breaking it down from the executive to the senior managers within the organization. They also had early metrics about the same time and over time refined the metrics so that it was a robust package of metrics, but still few metrics to go with their few targets. The end of the year, Takashi made reference to the reflection process, and so our end of the year reflection process was something that they experienced, a new way of ending the year, and at the end of 2009, creating a robust plan to start 2010. The red box, from the executive's point of view, was a come apart. From my point of view, was a sign of maturity within their group. We started 2010, and the senior leaders rebelled. They went back to their executive and said, that plan we made in 2009 for this year, it's not going to work. It's not going to work because we were in our old mode where you said, this is what I want you to do. And we said, sure, we'll find a way. But as they tried to take that find a way attitude and depict on their long-term schedule, what exactly they were going to do to assure the leader and depict visually a clear path toward achieving each of those targets. They found it wasn't acceptable to put a find a way sticker on the board. <laughs> if I didn't know how I was going to find a way, I had to go back and say, clearly, right now, I don't know how I'm going to find a way, so we need to renegotiate. You heard previously that that negotiation was a very important part of the reflection process. With this one organization, we just delayed it by a month. Um, <clears throat> then by the first year in, we were doing reflections twice a year, a mid-year a mid reflection, and then the end of the year, we'll have an end-of-year reflection. Also, about one year in, we started deploying OBEA down throughout the organization. At the same time, you will recall, you saw this chart already of the many tools. Here in the middle in green is OBEA, where we have chosen to always start within BCA. Um, but there are, the boxes in blue show tools that have been used somewhere in BCA. Uh, as we are learning the techniques and, and tools. So I want to now show you, for that same organization, the tools that they implemented in their first year. Early on, they implemented process and process. Process and process is a means of, you might think of it as mind mapping. It's taking the thought processes of one engineer 
very deep knowledgeable person approaching a complex problem? What decisions does he have to make? What are the alternates that might come? What data does he need to, dry, to uh, make those decisions? And methodically plotting that out on a wall, then bringing in a larger team and using this as a natural way of mentoring uh, less experienced engineers in the thinking of the deep technical resource and also of managing the problem resolution and taking the mind of one to direct the plan of many, the, or the actions of many. They also use the total link system chart. Um, I think of this as value stream mapping on steroids. It is an approach to value stream mapping that uses the real documents. If you do something on the computer, you take screenshots, you take a true case study where the process failed, but was rather typical, and you map that doing your structured five whys, finding your root causes, and probably the most important thing from the Boeing perspective we had always looked at lean in the past as I go and do a lean project, I develop my Kaizen newspaper, and I track it to closure. It's over here. And then I come back to my office, and over here is my real job. So there was always that competition between my lean project and my real job. What we have done with the TLSC and the OBEA is the actions that come out of here go right onto your OBEA board and they are mapped and tracked as part of your real job, because they are. Um, the other that I want to touch on very briefly, we're running short on time here, is uh, the feedback sheets. Takashi mentioned this, that this is a way of capturing our lessons learned in a very methodical way that is available upstream. So if I have a problem in the factory and I record it onto a feedback sheet up in product design, and sustaining engineering, they're going to see those problems, resolve them there so they don't hit the factory again. And then the workload visibility, again, a disciplined and methodical way that an individual engineer can more thoroughly um, understand and decompose the tasks they have to do with a forward-looking one month, and their managers can see what's going on and help, um, help rebalance the line. So how do we go through doing these different tools? As you saw with the one group, they looked at four tools in a year. We do that with short workshops in a very, again, structured way. You keep hearing those words structured and disciplined. They're what really resonate with me. We bring in a few people, ideally five or six as the maximum. Now, they might be representing teams of 40 plus. But the few come in and work either with an internal consultant, if we're already self-sufficient in that tool, or an external consultant if we are learning it as well. But we work at the wall in a very visual method with a very few people to depict the problem and the solution and the go-forward plan. And then these people share back with the larger team but sharing again in small groups, no rooms of 300 people, eight people maximum in the room, so we share ideas freely. So if we had 40 people, we would share five times, but we share then gathering the input from the, from the many and improving the output from the workshop. Also, we do lots of work with sticky notes, and the intention there is to make sure no one gets too tied to that solution because you're the first people taking a look at it, and you're going to improve it by input from many. And if it's sticky notes, we simply take that sticky note off the wall and replace it until we refine it, but we don't put it in the computer until we're sure that it is the right plan. <clears throat> and I think I have one more chart. Um, this is our biggest lessons learned. Starting with the leadership team is absolutely crucial. And if I could uh, emphasize only one point, if there's only one thing that you carry away, it's start with that VP. 
We've started with VPs that, uh, well, the largest group that we've worked with for an extended period of time is a group of 1,500. Um, we have recently begun with another group that's probably three times that size. Um, <clears throat> Visualization is going to give you quick and early benefits. The culture change is going to take a while. And it's going to take consistent, disciplined effort every day from the leadership team on down. And if the leaders are not applying it to themselves, then they can't lead the organization in being this consistent, committed uh, willingness to try new methods and then this one that I would encourage you on, when you have a new tool you're going to try, how many people in the room are engineers? Show of hands. Quite a few of us, this will resonate. Being engineers, we see the tool or plan and we say, oh, I have a better way. No, first try it. First try it as it is and learn the better way, then develop the better way, but do it through a journey approach. So in summary, we've had good success with the methodology in the Boeing company. We are still on our journey. By no means have we touched everyone in the Boeing company, nor everyone in commercial airplanes. But in the thousands that we have been working with, we have found it to be uh, highly effective and a lot of hard work, but with good results.